I am Rasul Serdar in Istanbul. After last month's attack that killed six people in this city's tourist district, the Turkish government blamed the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, and its affiliated groups in neighboring countries. In response, Ankara launched airstrikes against Kurdish fighters in northern Iraq and Syria. Turkey has also threatened to launch a ground operation into northern Syria to secure its southern border. The U.S. and Russian governments have warned against such a move. But if the Turkish military goes ahead with a ground offensive, what will be its wider regional impact? And is the Turkish government taking these measures as a political strategy ahead of the next year's general election? We will put that to the man who has served as a member of the Turkish National Security and Foreign Policy Council, chief advisor to President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The Turkish presidential spokesman Ibrahim Kalın talks to Al Jazeera. Ibrahim Kalın, Turkish presidential spokesman. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kalın, since the November 13 bombing here in the heart of Istanbul, Turkish officials have insisted that they want a ground offensive in Syria, and weeks have passed. So where do things stand now? In the recent uh, incident when uh, the terrorists uh, attacked uh, the civilians uh, on Istiklal Street, which is the, you know, the, uh, one of the kind of hard points, uh, you know, main points of Istanbul, uh, of course we had to respond. And our initial response was to uh, coordinate and uh, uh, conduct a number of air operations. And of course, depending on the threat level, uh, as assessed by our intelligence and our defense ministry and other related agencies, uh, we will go after these terrorists, whether from the air or from the ground. So the attack in Istanbul have triggered all of these uh, preparations for a potential uh, ground offensive in Syria, and you accuse YPG of being behind the attack in Istanbul. However, some argue that Turkey is using this as an excuse to attack YPG. Do you have any substantial evidence that YPG is responsible for that attack? Yes, we do. In fact, we have established very clearly YPG PYD was behind this attack. We have the person who carried out, who brought the bomb and who carried out the attack, but also people who uh, facilitated uh, the arrival of that person, a lady. Uh, in recent years, PKK has changed its, 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 its tactics now. Rather than using like Syrian, uh, say, Kurds or others, they're using other people from different nationalities to kind of cover themselves up, you know, behind this, behind this attack. But it was clearly uh, coordinated uh, by PYD, YPG. For this potential ground offensive, if, if you decide to conduct it, what is going to be the extent of this ground operation geographically and also what are its objectives, so, and what is the timeline for accomplishing the mission? For us, uh, any and all PKK, PYD, YPG establishments, elements, uh, posts, military uh, points are legitimate targets for us. Whether they are uh, in western Syria or in eastern Syria, northern Syria, near the border or far away from it. They are legitimate targets because they are terrorist organizations. And we go after them to protect our border. We know that Americans also have a heavy military presence there. So isn't that going to create a risk of a direct military confrontation between two largest NATO members, namely Turkey and the US? That's why we have a deconflicting mechanism uh, with the Americans and the Russians. Uh, we don't target Russian or American soldiers or military posts uh, in Syria or anywhere else. American Our officials are saying that you are PKK, PYD, YPG elements. And we tell them to stay away, of course, from those elements. You see, PYD, YPG is using, at one point, the American flag, at another point, the regime flag to protect itself, saying that, you see, you cannot attack us because there are Americans here, or you cannot attack us because there are regime forces here. Sometimes they do this with the Russians, less so recently, but in the past. That, I think, shows the extent to which PYD, YPG is using their alliance with the United States to legitimate uh, their own uh, presence uh, in northern Syria. Americans are saying that your recent airstrikes in Syria are putting American soldiers' life in risk. Do you agree with that? No. No, we, as I said, we have communicated this message very clearly to our American allies that we don't target Americans, we don't target civilians, we don't, tar we don't target uh, 
Russians or, or Iranians or others. Our, our targets are specifically PKK, PYD, YPG elements. Mr. Cullen, Syria is a multiplayer ground. Have you been in touch with Damascus, Tehran, and Moscow? So, and what's the nature of the negotiations with these capitals? Well, we coordinate, uh, of course, uh, with Russia and with Iran. Uh, not only, say, uh, you know, military operations, but also the refugee situation, humanitarian aid, the political process, there's a number of other things, a big file. Um, uh, we don't have direct contact with the Assad regime except through our intelligence services, uh, and they've been talking to each other, uh, you know, when they need to, uh, and that's mostly to coordinate, uh, um, you know, either security-related issues or refugees or some other things. Um, but of course, the Syria, conflict has turned into a frozen conflict right now. The world has forgotten Syria. The world's attention has now moved to Ukraine. Uh, but the Syrian problem is still out there. It has not been resolved. There are many shareholders, stakeholders in Syria. That's why I'm asking that particularly. What have been the nature of the negotiations with Tehran and Moscow? Did they approve your operation or do they give you a green light for that? Look, we don't ask for permission, we just coordinate with our allies when we face a national security threat. Um, in regards to uh, the political situation uh, in, in, in Syria, uh, of course it remains a source of threat and uncertainty for everyone, not just for us, but for Iraq, for Jordan, you know, for other countries as well, Europe, uh, etc. Yeah, coming back to the potential Turkish ground offensive in Syria, um, the U.S. has reportedly offered you to withdraw YPG from Tal Rafat to stop you attacking uh, YPG. Can you confirm that it is the case and what oh, is the White no. House telling you? No, I have seen this report in the media, uh, but we have, what we have told uh, uh, the Americans is that we already have an agreement back in we signed that back in 2019. And if they stick to that agreement, I mean the PYD, YPG, and of course they have to force PYD, YPG because we don't have contact with them, uh, you know, to stick to that agreement and move away about 30 kilometers from the Turkish border, then we don't have a problem. Uh, but we don't have that kind of a deal that, you know, if you stop this, we will move this or we will put our soldiers in between, etc. We had that agreement already before. Uh, as I said, with Americans, with the Russians also. But when we see this kind work. of attacks continue, yes, yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. Of course, it, you know, it's not our side that is breaking the agreement. You see, they're violating the agreement, not us. But what is the White House telling you specifically about your, um, your, your military preparations to conduct a ground offensive in Syria now? Well, they are saying that they are concerned, but we are telling them, look, you are concerned, we are attacked. There's a difference between the two. Being concerned is one thing. Being attacked in the heart of Istanbul, being attacked in the border city of Urfa, Karkamush, and losing six people here, three people there, and then potentially more people is a whole different thing. But Washington says that a Turkish ground offensive in Syria will further destabilize the situation, impacting the fight against ISIL. And also there are some reports mm -hmm. that suggest there are some 10,000 ISIL prisoners in the areas controlled by YPG, and YPG representatives say that if Turkey attacks, they cannot guarantee that they can keep these prisoners there. So by weakening Syrian democratic forces, which YPG is its backbone, don't you think that you are opening the door for ISIL to return to your borders? No, to the contrary. Actually, it shows that PYD, YPG is using ISIS or Daesh prisoners as political hostages for political negotiations, uh, to get more support, military support, weapons, money, political support, media support uh, from the Americans and from the Europeans. President Erdogan uh, has said he won't rule out a meeting with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Is that still a possibility and how soon do you think that this meeting will happen? Uh, I don't know if or when it will happen, honestly. We have to see a lot of work to be done on the ground. Uh, will the regime take a very clear stance against PKK, PYD, YPG, and other elements in Syria? So that's number one. So number you have two, three conditions then? Well, yeah, as I said, you know, the reason why we have severed our relationship with the Assad regime, you know, back in 2011, 2012, was because of what was happening in Syria. What happened? You remember when we had good relationship uh, uh, with, uh, with the Assad regime, with Mr. Assad himself, our president, uh, we were working on improving our relationship 
And in fact, our president was the first to tell President Assad at that time to recognize the rights of the Syrian Kurds, long before anybody talked about the Kurds in Syria. A meeting with al-Assad uh, may be geopolitically beneficial, but with Damascus continued attacks its own population. So what are the moral grounds for such a meeting? And also, should the Syrian opposition worry that they may lose Ankara's support? We continue to support the legitimate Syrian opposition. We have done so uh, in a very steadfast manner. Uh, despite the fact that almost the entire world has forgotten them. Uh, Europeans have forgotten them, Americans have forgotten them, many Arab countries have forgotten them, but we have not. As I said, we don't have an immediate plan for such a meeting, but our president is basically sending a message that, look, if you act responsibly, if you address the security concerns and uh, allow the political process to move forward, then you know, I might be prepared to take that step to advance the political process, to protect the Syrian people, establish a regional peace and security, uh, and also establish uh, peace and order along the uh, Turkish-Syrian border. If these things happen, then I'm willing to give it a chance. So he's not saying that he will be meeting you know, out of the blue or just for the sake of meeting. No. Uh, you know, he is the leader who has uh, carried the, the brunt of this battle almost single-handedly uh, for the last 10 years. We are not only hosting 4 million Syrian refugees in Turkey, but also we are looking after another 4 or 5 million Syrian IDPs and other people on the Syrian side. As I said, that's almost half of Syria's population. Mr. Kalan, uh, Turkey's um, military activities in Syria and Iraq cannot be disconnected from the other regional developments. NATO expansion, your delicate ties with Moscow, the war in Ukraine, the grain deal. Are you using an internal security issue to benefit at the external level? No, not at all. The security threats are coming from outside. We are responding to them. You know, we don't want to get involved in any kind of military operation unless it's a necessity. It's a defensive war. We want to, you know, continue to uh, focus on our economic development or our, on our defense industry, on investing more in education, our health system, trade, industry, export, import, and other things. But when you are faced as a country with a security threat, you, you have to respond to it. So this is not something that we are inviting. But, you know, say the war in Syria, in, in instability and security in Iraq, the situation, say, in, uh, in the Caucasus or in the Aegean, or, or the war in Ukraine. You know, we don't, we have not started these wars. We're, we have no interest in continuing any of these conflicts. To the contrary, we've been telling everybody, all stakeholders, that regional peace and security is in the interest of everyone. So let's try to find a solution. The relations with um, predominantly pro-Kurdish HDP and Kurds in general in Turkey have always been delicate issues. So what is now happening? behind the scenes. HTP is represented in the Turkish parliament. They are voted uh, by the people and elected. But the problem is that HTP has not been able to take a very clear stance against the PKK and uh, their ties with various PKK elements are well known uh, and they don't, they don't deny it. And that of course raises lots of question marks uh, about their standing, about their legitimacy, about their policies. Uh, but of course we respect the will of the people who uh, vote for them, but of course we question their political motives and their inability to distinguish themselves clearly uh, from the PKK. So your, how does your government see a future political process with HDP and Kurds? So HDP and YPG are not the same, correct? Well, they're not. Well, first of all, let me put it this way. Uh, PKK doesn't represent the Kurds. Just as Daesh and Al-Qaeda does not represent Muslims you know, on a global scale, PKK doesn't represent the Kurds. Uh, there are, the vast majority of the Kurds do not vote for PKK. However, uh, they or have a significant PKK. support from the Kurdish public. There are, they have, some, as I said, they are legitimately elected into the parliament. We respect that. But if, if you, you can, it will be wrong. It will be an insult to the Kurds themselves to say that PKK, HDP, or PYD, YPG represents them. Moving on to the broader region. Uh, President Erdogan has criticized Egypt's uh, human rights records. 
and also he has criticized several Western countries of embracing uh, President Sisi's administration, which came to power after a coup that killed uh, hundreds of people. So after nine years, why does Ankara seem to be keen to normalize its relations with Cairo? And by doing that, aren't you also adopting the same very policy that you have been criticizing for years? There is a change in the entire Gulf region. <clears throat> Do you remember uh, the problems not only with, with Egypt, the coup attempt and people being killed and so put in prison, uh, political prisoners, uh, but also blockade against Qatar. Uh, there's alliance between Saudi Arabia and UAE and Egypt and few other countries against not only Qatar, but also against us. This was uh, um, a regrettable period where I think we lost a lot of political, economic, and social opportunities. Now things began to change. Qatar stood its ground. Emir of Qatar came out stronger as a statesman uh, out of that crisis. And then other countries began to revise their policies. And they, they realized, OK, you know, maybe this is not the way to go. Uh, and maybe they were frustrated. I think they were and disappointed. Uh, you know, by the American policies, by you know the, the policies of, of other European countries, etc. So they they changed. They began to change. Well, things haven't changed in Egypt. Still, there so are grave I mean, could, human rights violations yeah, in I mean, the country. I'm, I'm coming to that. You see, the whole thing. I mean, the whole political uh, landscape has changed over the last year or so uh, in the Gulf, all the way from uh, from Gulf to Egypt, Mediterranean, and other places. And uh, we. We saw this as an opportunity, and we welcome we welcome that development. Will uh, President Erdogan and President Sisi have a formal meeting anytime soon? Nothing is planned at this point, but we will see how things go. As again, there are things that uh, need to be done uh, by both sides. But it's good that you know a handshake has taken place to address these issues. Sometimes this constellation of interests and perspectives change and, and they create some opportunities and, uh, and you go for those opportunities. So your when government arise. has changed its approach to some Gulf countries like the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. How would you describe now your relations with Abu Dhabi and Riyadh? And in the past, even some of the officials from your government have accused the United Arab Emirates of financing the failed coup attempt in 2016. So what has changed there? Uh, we, we have turned a new page. We believe we should join our forces, economic, political, social forces, social capital, uh, to help and, and, and uh, increase and deepen regional peace and stability. That is in everybody's interest. So how does your government see Iran's uh, growing influence in Lebanon, in Yemen, Iraq, and Syria? Do you feel threatened? We have always believed that uh, Iran should be engaged rather than isolated. Engaging Iran uh, including them uh, in the geopolitical picture of the region and the, and the wider region is always a better option uh, than isolating or attacking uh, Iran. Now, having said that, uh, of course, we know that the countries that you mentioned also uh, express concern from time to time because of the Iranian involvement. So, so considering and, all of these, these, these dynamics and the different approach of the policies, don't you feel threatened by the Iranian growing influence? It's not so much being threatened, but rather trying to get all the uh, perspectives and interests of all key players in the region, you know, closer to one another. Again, differences will there be. There will be differences, no doubt, uh, on, on certain issues. Uh, but, you know, we, we advise them, Iranians included, uh, to have a regional perspective so that, you know, we empower each other rather than fight against each other. So, uh, moving on uh, away from the region, how will you assess your relationships with Moscow and Washington? Are you standing uh, in the middle despite being a major NATO member? Uh, we see foreign policy as a 360 degree engagement. We don't, we don't see it as a mutually exclusive game. Uh, where, uh, you know, if you, if you are part of an alliance like NATO, for example, uh, then you cannot have engagement with Russia or vice versa. It's not a zero-sum game. I think we've uh, proven the value of this policy um, over the years, uh, especially given Turkey's geopolitical location, you know, our position between uh, east and west, north and south, um, and our uh, larger hinterland, uh, which uh, 
is a blessing of our history and culture and geography. Uh, and if you use it properly, it's a blessing. But if you don't, then it becomes a burden. Um, uh, we uh, seek to maintain this balance you know, between different stakeholders. Uh, but you didn't uh, join the other NATO members who have decided to put sanctions on Moscow. For a very specific and I think solid reason, which we have explained to our allies for mainly two reasons. Number one, we don't want to be affected by sanctions and we don't want to penalize our own economy. We have already been affected negatively by all the sanctions uh, against Iran, against Iraq in the past, against other countries, now against Russia. Uh, why should we penalize? The nature of our economic relationship with Russia is such that impl implementing sanctions on Russia will jeopardize our economy, our economic interests, more than the Russian uh, economic interests. And it will not change the Russian behavior in any significant way anyway. But number two, uh, reason, which is as important, uh, is the fact that we've said from the very beginning of this conflict that if everybody burns bridges with Russia, who's going to talk to them at the end of the day for negotiations and talks? I was about to actually ask yeah. about that. So far, any attempt to bring uh, President Putin and President Zelensky uh, around a negotiating ta table, they, they all have failed. So do you see any concrete possibility of such a meeting? I know President Erdogan has been very much keen to see them negotiating around a table. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, giving the realities on the ground, it's not that um, likely to happen immediately, but we believe it's possible and we will continue to work on it. You see, there are two sides to this conflict. One is uh, Russian occupation of Ukrainian land, which should come to an end, no doubt about it. Russian forces should withdraw from Ukrainian land. Ukraine's territorial integrity should be reestablished and Ukraine should be given security guarantees to protect itself, to defend itself uh, against any future aggression of this type. There's no question about that. And Ukraine should be supported uh, economically uh, for its reconstruction because many cities have been, have been destroyed uh, and there should be uh, more support for, for Ukraine. And militarily as well? Militarily, of course, as I said, for their own self-defense, they need, they need that support. But this is one level of the conflict. The other one is what's happening at the larger geopolitical level. And that, that, there, what you have is a hegemonic power struggle between Russia and the West. There needs to be another engagement at, at this geopolitical level uh, where uh, a new deal, a new bargain, if you like, between Russia and the West needs to be struck again. Yes, sir. We, you're that, talking about a new regional order. Yes. What we are seeing right now is Cold War 2.0. It started with Ukraine war, uh, but it will probably continue in some other ways. A symmetrical war, hybrid war, and many other types of war probably will continue until and unless we see the larger geopolitical picture bring the key stakeholders together and uh, establish the parameters of a new grand global deal, a new security architecture where everybody feels a part of that process, everybody owns the process. Nobody tries to impose anything in a hierarchical manner on others. Uh, nobody sees others as inferior but rather as equal partners, eye-to-eye -eye relationship. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Cullen, Turkey and Hungary are the last two NATO members uh, to ratify Sweden and Finland's accession to the military alliance. When will you ratify it, and will it happen any time before the next year's election? We signed an agreement uh, with Finland and Sweden at the last NATO summit. Um, and we established a permanent mechanism to address these issues and to advance this process. And we have laid out our terms very clearly. Our Swedish and Finnish colleagues know what they are. And they are making progress uh, as, as part of the agreement to implement uh, the conditions of the agreement. They are making progress. There are uh, the Swedes introduced uh, a constitutional amendment. They are now making uh, legal changes to follow up on this. Aren't these steps big steps that satisfy your demands? We have specific issues that we have raised and, and shared with our colleagues there. And they're making, they're working on them, they're making progress, and we acknowledge and appreciate uh, that progress. But there are still uh, threats for our national security in those countries, and they know uh, what they are. Look, for Sweden and Finland to make a decision to join NATO after 200 years of military neutrality is a paradigm shift in their political history. And now Turkey is the only obstacle? No, we're not. We're not, we helping them.
to get rid of the security threats. Look, one of the key elements of NATO alliance is the fight against terrorism. NATO is not a tourism club. It's not a cuisine club. Right? It's, it's not a social club. It's a security alliance, which means that the security concerns of all members need to be addressed equally. There are no hierarchies there. As we take the security concerns of our NATO allies, any one of them, they, 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 they are expected to take our security concerns very seriously as well. And I think this mutually empowering win-win situation, I think, will, will, will help us go through this, this process once, uh, you know, they uh, complete their work uh, and they take this concrete steps, uh, then the process will move forward. Ibrahim Kalin, Turkish presidential spokesman. Thank you for talking to us. My pleasure.